All right, well, welcome uh, back, everyone. Um, as Esther mentioned tonight, we're going to be talking about state and local income taxes and also the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so if you have questions, feel free uh, at any point in time to address those. What we're going to be looking at today is kind of a nice overview of what state and local taxes are going to be uh, handled within the, uh, the scope of IDA. Uh, so what we want to be able to be sure is that we can walk through your common situations, things that you're going to be seeing within the sites. Uh, so we're going to be talking about how some things may be a little bit different than what we've talked about over the past couple weeks. What's going to be different for things like filing requirements and how income may be a little bit different from federal. So if you have questions, feel free uh, to bring those up, uh, particularly if they're related to VITA. We'll kind of let you know whether or not they're typical ones that we see within uh, our program. Uh, if they're a little bit more complex, we can certainly take some time at the break or after the session to go through in more detail for you. Okay, so we're going to hit right in and start off with state and local income tax. So one of the things that's different, um, in addition to no longer using the 4012 for state and local income tax, since the IRS only covers their piece, the uh, 1040, uh, we do have some additional information in your volunteer guide. So we actually have a lot of pages in your volunteer guide that will go through some of those state and local issues that uh, we'll be covering this evening. So we're, in the past, we've referred you to a tab in the 4012. Tonight we're going to be uh, having you refer to your volunteer guide for some additional information. So one of the first things we're going to take a look at is filing requirement, almost like how we started off our initial IRS session. When we first talked about filing requirements for federal income tax, we talked about filing status and gross income. For Pennsylvania, we're going to change that completely. The only thing we're going to be looking at is whether or not there was gross income over $33. Relatively low threshold. So $33. Why is it $33? Pennsylvania actually has a flat tax. Uh, they actually have a 3.07. You do not need to memorize that. That's not an easy number to go ahead and keep in your head, but 3.07% is the tax rate PA uses on all taxable income. If you take $33, multiply it by 3.07%, you come up with a dollar of tax. That's why PA wants to go ahead and see it. Now, not to say that we're going to be having a lot of people owe returns, because we're going to be talking about a program a little bit later in the uh, session that even though we call it a flat tax, it actually is not. Uh, we're going to show how it's a back-ended kind of graduated tax rate. We do have some abilities to have tax forgiveness, which is almost like an exemption from tax. We also have some tax credits that people can apply for as well. So we just want to kind of take a look and say it's a $33 gross income. So while we have people who may not have a federal filing requirement, we may need to file APA return for them. Uh, in addition, if someone has more than $33, um, that would be triggering a filing requirement. Or if they have a loss from a business, if they have a loss from a K-1 that's passing through, uh, if they have an S-corporation or partnership activity, those would be reasons that they would need to file as well. So even if they have no income, Pennsylvania wants to see a return if they have a loss coming through off a Schedule K-1 or a sole proprietorship. Uh, again, Pennsylvania does not have a rule that exempts minors, uh, not actual coal miners, but actually minor children from the filing requirement. So if you have a four-year-old who has an interest account with $50 in it, they theoretically have a filing requirement. Uh, kind of the tips and uh, techniques that we use, if you've already filed a PA return, continue to file a PA return. Uh, PA may be taking a look to see why they haven't gotten one. If you've been filing in the past and all of a sudden you stop filing, uh, you may get an inquiry from the Commonwealth wondering where your return is. It's not a problem if you have less than $33, but once you start, we recommend continue filing. And we'll talk about that specifically when we get to Lancaster County. So Pennsylvania, $33 you need to file. If you have a loss, you need to file. Basic rule of thumb, you need to file. So if you're coming into VITA, we already complete all the information. We almost have everything we need to complete the return. So it's very easy for us to electronically file APA return. The one return we cannot electronically file is the Lancaster County. Now, Lancaster County is a little bit different. Uh, Lancaster County is going to be based on earned income tax only. So that's going to be based only on wages, self-employment income, uh, areas from a partnership. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get through the state section. So not everyone's going to have to fill out a local earned income tax return. However, if you do get a pre-printed form from Lancaster County, one of these 
bless you. One of these nice little pre-printed pink sheets with someone's name and address on it. We need to go ahead and send that back in. If they do get a pre-printed printed sheet, it means the Lancaster County Tax Collection Bureau is looking for a return from them. If we do not send one in, they can charge $25 per taxpayer for failure to file. So we do want to be sure we file that and we'll give you some more pointers here uh, when we just get in a little bit more detail on the local return. So who needs to file a local return? Well, if you lived in Lancaster County or if you lived in the Octorera School District in Chester County, Lancaster County Tax Collection Bureau is your tax authority. Uh, usually we just refer to it as LCTCB. First of all, it's a whole lot easier to say than Lancaster County Tax Collection Bureau time and time again. Um, even though it does sound like it's an ice cream or yogurt shop, LCTCB is just simply our abbreviation for how we're going to write checks and refer to it in our instructions. Uh, so again, what we're looking at is earned income. Uh, if you had any earned income, net profits, any source of employment in 2017, you will need to file a local return. Now there is an exception. If you are under the age of 16, you are an exempt uh, individual for purposes of local filing requirements. So you would not need to file a local return if you're under the age of 16. Uh, however, sometimes employers don't always do that correctly and they will start withholding for younger employees. Uh, if that happens, simply go ahead and file the return for a uh, minor child and write exempt uh, or stay, put an attachment and that money can be refunded. They are not obligated to pay Pennsylvania tax. Or I'm sorry, Pennsylvania tax, yes, local tax, no. Okay, any questions on filing requirements? And as Ezra kind of alluded to, we may have the ability, if all goes well, if everyone crosses their fingers between now and January 18th when the program goes live, maybe we can do local returns through our tax system if everything goes well. Um, if it doesn't, we'll show you how to do these manually. Now, Pennsylvania has a different uh, system of taxation. Uh, the federal government had a policy to say everything's taxable unless we tell you it is not. Pennsylvania, on the other hand, actually only taxes eight different classes of income. Sounds simple, right? Well, we're going to take a little bit more of a look into each of these various classes. What are the things that we're commonly going to see within the VITA program? Uh, the first one that we typically see uh, is wage income. Uh, if someone has a W-2, it's going to be reported in our top line of income. It's going to be actually one of the easiest ones to work with. And we'll go through some tips and techniques on how to be sure we have the appropriate amount of wage income on the return. Second category is going to be interest. Uh, interest income uh, is pretty much what we'll see from the federal. We'll show you a couple adjustments as we get into uh, perhaps some interest that's not taxable for PA purposes. Dividends are pretty much uh, going to follow from federal as well. The one difference that you'll probably see as you go through the return is that there are going to be certain things that move around from the federal to the state return. If you have a brokerage statement that has uh, capital gain distributions coming from a mutual fund, Pennsylvania will actually move those to a dividend item of income, not capital gain income, like they would be on a 1040. Um, kind of while we're talking about kind of some differences with PA, just want to mention PA, while the return looks like it's a joint return, it is actually not a joint return if you have a married filing um, jointly couple. Uh, technically, the return is two individuals filing on the convenience of one form. So if you take a look at the return, a spouse's losses cannot offset a taxpayer's gain. So when we get to areas like business income, where one taxpayer may have some income from business, the other one may have generated a loss, we cannot offset those amounts. So we have to pick up the income for the taxpayer and the spouse's loss is unutilized. We can't use that to offset any other items of income. So we can't use a loss from a uh, spouse to offset a taxpayer. You also can't use a loss from one category to offset income from another category. So if you're used to looking at math and thinking things should work, PA does not recognize negative numbers. So when you go through the process, it's only going to add the positive numbers. It will not take any negative into account. So if you know that you have a business loss and you're wondering why is there a zero on the form, it means that it is not able to offset any other uh, activity. So a zero would be an appropriate entry. Usually we may see zeros not in the first three lines. because It's very hard to have negative wages, negative interest, or negative dividends, even though in the, today's interest rate, it feels like you're not making anything off your money, but there's no negative interest component. But we may see that when we get to this uh, fourth category, business income. Uh, business income is an area that we'll be talking about a lot more next week uh, when we talk about our advanced certification. But if you do run into business losses, again, it can only be used to offset other business income from that taxpayer. It cannot be used to offset the spouse and cannot be used to offset other classes of income. 
The fifth one that we sometimes see is going to be gain or loss from the sale of property. That could either be from the sale of a residence. Typically, we won't see that very often because of the exclusion rules for uh, both federal and PA. But it will typically come from sales of security, stocks and bonds, uh, mutual funds, those types of things. Uh, the other couple categories, uh, two of which we won't see at all. Uh, we do not have rent royalty in a scope of service for VITA. So because we can't handle things like depreciation, some other complex areas, we do not actually handle rental activity within VITA. We also do not do uh, estate and trust work. Uh, if you do have a K-1 coming through, there may be some exceptions we can take a look at, but we do not do the actual estate and trust work itself. Uh, last category is gambling and lottery winnings. This is kind of the last to the uh, bunch on the uh, PA return. Uh, one we don't often see, but we do need to make sure that if a taxpayer does have gambling or lottery winnings, we are picking it up correctly. We always used to say in the past, if you wanted to buy a lottery ticket, particularly Mega Millions or the Powerball, buy it in PA. Because up until two years ago, any winnings you had from a national lottery, if the ticket was bought in PA, was exempt from PA tax. That changed. So now it doesn't matter where you buy your lottery ticket. If you want to go to the shore and buy lottery tickets while you're on vacation, that's fine. It's still going to be taxed in PA irrespective of where you actually purchase the ticket. So if there are any gambling winnings, that would be reported on the eighth line. Um, so that includes anything that people have, either from the PA lottery, from the casinos, anything along those lines would be reported as taxable gambling winnings. Okay, so now that we went over kind of the things that PA does tax, the eight categories of income, there are a lot of exceptions that PA has. PA does not tax retirement dollars for the most part. It will not tax Social Security, will not tax railroad retirement benefits. Typically, will also not tax pension or retirement distributions. Now, there is one exception. You'll see an asterisk there. One of the things we had talked about when we covered income was the early distribution from a retirement plan. If an individual takes money out of a plan before they hit retirement age, and you'll see a 1099-R with a uh, code 1 in box 7, that's going to indicate that that's an early withdrawal from a retirement plan. Pennsylvania has the ability to tax that as compensation on the return. Now, Pennsylvania is a little bit unique. Um, when we take a look at the W-2s, what we'll see is that Pennsylvania does not allow a deduction for amounts contributed to a 401k, 403b, or other retirement plan. And the reason why they do that is because they do not tax distributions when they come out later, as long as you hit normal retirement age. Now, if you take your money out early, Pennsylvania is going to consider that as if it's money that you could have gotten as wages, but you simply deferred it. So if you take it out early, that's going to be considered wage income. Um, now, the trick is that it's only on the amounts paid by the employer and any gains you have in your account. Pennsylvania has what we call cost recovery rule. So any dollars you take out of your retirement plan are first treated as coming out of your own contribution. And then only after you've exhausted all your contributions is that excess amount taxed. What's the major problem we have in VITA? No one knows how much they contributed to the plan. It's difficult to come up with that number because there's uh, not really a great system to tell you what your contributions to the plan were. Uh, sometimes we get lucky, and what we'll see is an early withdrawal from a retirement plan happened because an employee had been working for the company maybe a year or so, uh, decided to leave, they had a little bit of money contributed. We have a copy of the prior year return and the current year return, so we know how much they had contributed to the plan. So that's an easy number for us to come up with. Uh, if we can't come up with a number, the Commonwealth will come up with one for us, and we'll talk about this when we get to uh, gains and losses. The government's very willing to give you a number to put on the return. It's just generally one we don't like. They're going to tell you that number is zero, that there's no uh, employee contributions, which is not the case. So uh, if you do run into this situation, just bear in mind we can take the employee's uh, contributions to the plan. Uh, first, so that's non-taxable. There's a spot we can put it in on the return. Uh, we see this on occasion. Some of the returning volunteers, if you have have run into this on occasion at all? Well, we had we, we, we had the one where we were there where a fellow, a fellow left the company early, uh, he had about sixty thousand dollars to the retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Everything was broken then as far as his contributions, employer contributions, growth rate. Wonderful. That's, a, that's an excellent situation. So we can break it down and we know exactly how much they had contributed. We can reduce the amount that's taxable for PA purposes and then simply the amount uh, that's contributed by the employer and any earnings on the account would be subject to PA tax. So I say uh, hopefully everyone comes in as well prepared as Howard's clients do. All right.
So if we do run into those situations, hopefully we have some opportunity. If you do run into that and you're unsure of how to proceed, just go ahead and ask your uh, site coordinator and we can kind of work on a, a policy of how we can request some additional information. So some other things PA does not tax are unemployment compensation. So you don't have to pay wages for not working, unlike federal, which does uh, charge tax on unemployment uh, compensation. Uh, sick pay, disability pay is not taxable for Pennsylvania. Now there is alimony. Uh, also similar to federal, you do not need to pay tax on inheritances. So a couple of those items are going to be non-taxable for PA. However, we're going to see where PA will actually add uh, some of those items in later when we start talking about some tax forgiveness and some possibility of rent rebate uh, credits. Uh, also, there's going to be an active military duty pay exception. Uh, we are going to be covering a little bit of uh, military pay next week when we talk about some advanced topics, but if someone is actively uh, engaged in the military, their uh, Pennsylvania compensation uh, would not uh, be subject to tax on their active mil military duty pay. So we'll cover a couple more of those issues next week in advance if you are interested in working with members of the armed service. Okay, so what are we talking about in terms of these different categories? The first one we mentioned was the wage income. The nice part about wage income is Pennsylvania actually has a form, the W-2S, which is going to report how much we've entered on the uh, tax layer program for federal wages, Medicare wages, and state wages. It's a great form if you want to go ahead and double check your work. Uh, make sure they have all the W-2s entered, all the information entered correctly. Now, as we mentioned about retirement plans, oftentimes box one of the federal W-2 will not match the state wages that you're going to see in box 16. If anyone has contributed to a retirement plan, uh, those numbers are quite often going to be different. So just the main thing we keep in mind is when we enter the W-2 information into TaxSlayer, just enter the W-2 exactly as you see it. Make sure that you're taking a look at box 16. Box 16 frequently will need a uh, new number to be entered in. Once you enter it in, it's going to go uh, immediately through the system and be a uh, report on the correct line of the W-2. Uh, box 17 is typically where we're going to see state withholding. Uh, for the most part, uh, box 16 and 17, I think we're pretty good on. Not really a whole lot of issues there. Uh, the local wages, however, may be a little interesting. Sometimes we'll see employers that will uh, report the local services tax in box 19. That actually should be reported in box 14. So if you do see some odd things in the local area, just go ahead and double check the W-2, make sure that it actually looks like it makes sense. If you see a $52 amount of withholding, it most likely is local services tax, not local income tax withholding. And if we do put on the local return, Lancaster County Tax Collection Bureau, or LCTCB, will eventually catch up and realize that you did not overpay your local taxes. Quite often when we see local taxes are typically going to be um, generally a break-even scenario if they only have wage income, unless they have some unreimbursed expenses, or they may owe a little bit of money if there was a slight discrepancy. But typically we do not see large refund amounts on a uh, local return. So just watch to make sure that we see anything that's a local withholding that is actually based on wages, not on some other type of tax. Okay. Now the other interesting part about Pennsylvania is if you work in one of our surrounding states uh, or a state that the uh, Commonwealth has negotiated an agreement with, you do not need to pay tax in those jurisdictions. So the interesting area that we have here is the very first state that we report on our reciprocal list is Indiana which is nowhere close to being a t contiguous state to Pennsylvania. Uh, in fact, you have to drive through a couple states to get to Indiana. I've never seen a client that says, I drive daily to get to Indianapolis for my job. Um, but yet we negotiated a contract with them to say, if you work in Indiana, you do not need to pay Indiana state income tax. Your employer should be withholding PA. So we do have a lot of situations because we're so close to the border here uh, in Lancaster County with Maryland. We do see a number of clients that actually have jobs in Maryland. Their employer is supposed to be withholding Pennsylvania income tax. Uh, if that's the case, it doesn't matter. Uh, we can still prepare the PA return. Everything is going to be working normally. The W-2 should be reflecting PAs or state and just show their PA income tax. If for some reason the employer does not withhold PA, then we have to go through a different process. We actually have to file a Maryland and a PA return, uh, and report the uh, income in both states, but claim a credit in order to get uh, our money back. 
or technically the taxpayer's money back. Um, so hopefully we don't run into those situations. But the reciprocal states that that should happen, Indiana, Maryland, New Jersey, Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. That is correct, right. So if you have a move, basically what, what that is is that you're actually a part year resident for both states. So the reciprocal agreement covers full year residents. So if you're in PA for the entire time and you happen to have a job in Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Ohio, Indiana, you're all right. Um, but if you do move, then we're going to have to file two returns. And multi-state returns get to be very tricky with VITA. So you want to double check with your site coordinator before we handle multi-state issues. Um, so typically, we don't do that with VITA, but do check with your site coordinator if there becomes an issue. Now, you'll notice there are two states that are not on here that actually do border PA, one being Delaware. Uh, if you do have an individual who has a job in Delaware, uh, we sometimes see that with the construction industry. Uh, they may be working in Delaware for a couple of days. If they're in for a couple of days, they're going to have typically Delaware withholding, which means we would have to file a Delaware return as a non-resident, uh, go ahead and file that return, and then take a credit on PA. So again, we may have some issues uh, with those. The other state, New York. New York does not negotiate with any other state. If you work in New York, they're going to keep all your money. They're going to treat you as a uh, resident of New York, depending on how often you work there. And those are going to be some complex issues. So not to really throw a wrench in the works, I don't think we see a lot of taxpayers with multi-state issues. But just be aware if someone comes in and they say, I have some uh, um, questions about my income earned in other states, we may just want to go ahead and uh, ask a couple questions before we get too deep into the return. For the most part, these work fairly cleanly. Again, the wages are typically just going to be coming through off of their W-2. So usually we don't have to make a lot of adjustments. Now, the one area that is a little bit different is our uh, ability to deduct unreimbursed employee expenses. And so what we're going to take a look at here are the opportunity for us to write off any expenses that are related to employment. Uh, we did not really get much of a benefit on the federal return because in order to take an unreimbursed employee expense, first of all, the taxpayer had itemized deductions. So we had to get over the standard deduction threshold in order to even take an unreimbursed employee expense. The second hurdle, even after we get past the standard deduction, is the fact that we have to get over 2% of our adjusted gross income before we can deduct any benefit of our unreimbursed employee expenses, a 2% miscellaneous itemized deduction. So quite often, we do not get a benefit on the federal return. But we can take it for PA purposes. And there are a couple things we just want to take a look at here. Uh, in order to take the unreimbursed employee expense for PA, the expense has to be ordinary and necessary uh, for the industry or occupation that you're in. So a couple things that we want to just remind taxpayers about is that we need to uh, make sure that they have the opportunity to actually deduct these on their PA return. If an employee could have gotten reimbursed from their employer, but did not, they are not eligible to take an unreimbursed employee expense on the return. So what that means is if you have an employee who brings some receipts and says, I'm a uh, salesperson, uh, I had uh, some travel and I had some meals that I did not turn into my employer for reimbursement, can I take it on the PA return? The answer is no. If you had the ability to take it uh, to your employer for reimbursement, Pennsylvania will not allow you to take an unreimbursed employee expense deduction. Uh, the other area we're going to take a look at is Pennsylvania has been much more aggressive in pursuing unreimbursed employee expense claims. So there are a couple things that we just want to be sure that we communicate to our clients to make sure that they can substantiate and document the amount that they're reporting to us. A couple of the areas that we kind of uh, recommend is if you have anyone with unreimbursed employee expense, be sure that the occupation that you're putting on the PA return is appropriate for the amount that you're taking as an unreimbursed employee expense. So if you have someone who's a full-time college student, but they work a job in construction or pizza delivery, we probably want to change their occupation from student to construction worker or delivery person. That way, we actually have a better understanding to say, why are they having an unreimbursed employee expense as a student? It just helps alleviate some of those issues. That doesn't uh, prevent them from make, making sure that they keep documentation, but it does at least help us get to the point where they have a uh, basis to take an unreimbursed employee expense. A couple other things we need to take a look at. They have to be uh, paid in connection with employment. 
So in performing of duties, again, what we want to take a look at is make sure that they uh, sound, that they be appropriate. Uh, if we need to have safety goggles and steel tip boots, probably makes sense for a construction worker. Probably does not make sense for someone in a education setting. You probably don't need steel tip boots in your classroom unless you happen to be a shop teacher. Um, speaking of teachers, this is one area that we can actually see that they can take some additional deductions. We mentioned uh, last time about the educator deduction. That was at $250 for classroom supplies. That's actually uh, eligible to be a deduction for the PA return. And there's no $250 cap, so whatever the educator had spent is eligible for the unreimbursed employee expense. And oftentimes educators may have a couple other expenses as well, such as union dues, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. So again, what we're looking at here is the expenses have to be paid in connection with a business. It has to be in relation to ordinary or customary within the industry. It has to be reasonable and not excessive. So if someone's deducting travel, they have to go to Europe uh, to go meet with a client. Traveling by air is fine. Commonwealth will actually allow you to pick the class of travel you'd like to go in. But air travel is fine. Going across on the QE2 in the uh, presidential suite, taking a two and a half week trip to get to the UK is not a reasonable expense. It's a little excessive. So you cannot take an expense in that amount. Uh, but if it is travel, that's fine. We can go ahead and take a look and see um, just to make sure it's a reasonable in the amount. They have to be necessary to perform your duty. So we have to have a direct connection. So some things we're going to take a look at are making sure that uh, any unreimbursed expense are needed in order to perform your job. So they can, again, be excessive. And we'll talk about a couple of the uh, more common areas here in just a little bit. So as we mentioned, kind of the big ones are going to be things like the educator expenses. So if you do have school teachers that come in, we're going to take that $250 deduction, hopefully, for them as an adjustment to income. Uh, any amount that they do spend would be eligible for a Pennsylvania unreimbursed employee expense. The nice part is this also works for local returns as well. So sometimes the educators will also have union dues. So if you see someone who's coming in and they're a member of the union, uh, hopefully that they'll either have the information report on their W-2 or bring in their uh, a statement from the union saying how much their deductible union dues are. We also see this quite often with factory workers, uh, people in maintenance, uh, and also uh, systems of higher education may have union dues as well. They are deductible on the PA return. Uh, oftentimes, we'll also see some other work uniform and clothing. Uh, again, what we're going to be taking a look at here, it has to be used in performance of the job. Uh, one of the areas that they take a look at, kind of one of the uh, areas that we want to take a look uh, in terms of criteria, are that the clothing or other items are not adaptable for ordinary use. So we can't basically have a landscaper that says, I'm working outside, I'd like to buy a nice Carhartt jacket uh, because it's cold. And by the way, it's also going to work out very well when I go up for hunting season. Well, if you can use it for general use, it's not considered an unreimbursed employee expense. So what we're getting back to are things like safety equipment, steel tip shoes. Uh, perhaps if you're in a flagging position, maybe you have some uh, brightly colored neon items. Uh, perhaps there are other things that we take a look at uh, in terms of work uniforms. The criteria we used to use before would be to say, if you would not feel comfortable walking around outside of work hours in the clothing, that's probably indicating it's for work purposes only. But all you have to do is walk into any type of grocery store, department store, Walmart, and there's no dress code anymore. Now you can walk in, feel comfortable in your pajama bottoms and slippers, and go ahead and browse the electronics department. So we can't really say it has to be a standard that fits the, uh, uh, our society of feeling comfortable walking around. It's just more of an opportunity. Is it for a specific business purpose? If you're a mechanic and you have coveralls, that would be a work purpose. Generally, you don't throw on a pair of coveralls to head out to Thanksgiving dinner. So what we try and take a look at is what's the connection with the clothing, the supplies to the work environment. So if we take a look and it's uh, uh, used directly in the, in the performance of a job uh, duty, that would indicate that it's a deductible expense. If we have someone who's a server uh, for a restaurant and they need to have non-slip shoes, something along those lines that they're required to wear, uh, that would be fine. If they are getting a job at a bank and the bank says you need to look presentable, those are not deductible expenses. Wearing a nice shirt to go to work is not something that is a deductible expense because hopefully you'll wear that nice shirt somewhere else. 
Uh, so what we try and take a look at is if it's generally adaptable for ordinary use, it's not going to be considered an unreimbursed expense. Uh, we can take a look at small tools and supplies. Again, typically we may see that within the uh, construction industry. Uh, people may say, I need to provide my own tools for work. Uh, as long as they're reasonable, they're in relation to their job responsibility, those will be fine. Uh, any professional licenses, sometimes we'll see people in the medical field that have to pay for their own licenses. Uh, if they're not being reimbursed, and again, they do not have the ability to request reimbursement from their employer, then we can deduct those as an unreimbursed employee expense. Uh, sometimes we'll see people that have a vehicle expense, whether that is because they're in a position of a salesperson, uh, perhaps that they are a administrative worker at a company and the uh, company asks for them to make small deliveries, run to the post office, and they do not give them the opportunity to be reimbursed, they can take vehicle expenses. The important thing we need to take a look at vehicle, the state can request that you have a vehicle mileage log to document where you went, the business purpose, and the amount traveled. So we just want to be sure if someone says, I have some unreimbursed mileage, you say, great, we can take that. How much do you have? I have exactly $1,000 per month, or 1,000 miles per month. Every month, exactly 1,000 miles. Well, all right, probably not accurate. <clears throat> So again, what we want to re uh, remind them of is substantiation rules. To say, we're going to prepare the return with the information that you provide. However, all the information on the return is your responsibility. If either the state, the federal government, or LCTCP comes back to request information, that is going to be your responsibility. If it seems reasonable, we can go ahead and take it. If they say, I drive 100,000 miles for work, and they're not an over-the-road truck driver, it's probably unrealistic. Uh, so we can't go ahead and try and uh, reduce your tax liability by coming up with uh, false claims. Um, really, there are only a few deductions that you can take for PA. This is probably the biggest one we'll see is the unreimbursed employee expense. Um, but we do just want to uh, remind them of the rules that they need to have in substantiation of those expenses. But they can take any vehicle expense. Uh, that includes mileage, any parking, any tolls, uh, any other transportation, any travel away from home if they're required to be away for a period of time, as long as it's temporary. The one benefit Pennsylvania has is we do allow a deduction for 100% of meals and entertainment. Federal government only allows 50% because they believe you have some personal enjoyment out of meals and entertainment. I always like to think it's because Pennsylvania has more snack food in the Department of Agriculture than any other Commonwealth has, um, but it's actually a different reason. But it sounds better to say we're the snack food capital of the world. Um, we pr pr provide more chips, more pretzels, more chocolate factories than anyone else per capita. Um, but the real reason is, is because Pennsylvania just follows the uh, accounting rules and allows 100% of meals and entertainment. So if you do have those, it can be deducted in full. Again, the main things to take a look at, you can only take it if you do not have the ability to be reimbursed by your employer. And we are going to recommend that everyone substantiate their deduction and keep track of that if and when the Commonwealth does ask for a copy. Okay. Uh, sorry, getting a little, little fast for the clicker here. Uh, one of the things we do want to talk about, one of the other areas that we may see some adjustments for would be interest income. Interest income is generally going to follow directly from the federal return, except there are a few areas where Pennsylvania does not tax all the same interest. Pennsylvania does not have the ability to tax U.S. government interest. Only the federal government can tax their own interest. So any U.S. government interest is going to be exempt. So that includes interest from U.S. savings bonds. So when we went through the 1099 INT, and you saw that there was an amount in box three, that amount will automatically be excluded from the PA return. You generally do not need to make any adjustments. The areas where we may see some adjustments are that Pennsylvania will not tax interest earned from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania itself or any of its political subdivisions. So that means municipal bonds. So if you have a client who has interest coming off of a school district bond or a road improvement bond or a local library bond, those would be exempt for PA tax. And generally what we'll see is you'll get a brokerage statement that'll break down to say how much interest was earned from PA sources. All we have to do is put an adjustment in tax layer and uh, go ahead and remove that amount of interest taxable for PA. And we'll cover the tax layer portion when we get to uh, hack uh, beginning in January. Some other things that they uh, don't get to tax, in addition to the Commonwealth and any municipal uh, government uh, within the Commonwealth, is any uh, bonds or obligations from Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, or Guam. 
Truth be told, I have never seen any interest from Guam. Um, I assume that they have road improvement bonds, but I have yet to see any client that's invested in one. Uh, we may see some more areas coming out of uh, Puerto Rico once they're looking at uh, improving infrastructure after the uh, after the recent hurricane. Uh, but if you do have any uh, areas of interest from U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam, particularly Guam, if you do get one, I know we're not supposed to keep any information, but if anyone does see a bond from Guam, please photocopy it and just send it to me, because I'd love to see what that looks like. Um, but other than that, we uh, generally are going to see any adjustments mainly just from PA municipal bond interest. That's going to be our typical adjustment. We're going to see that from the brokerage statement and enter it right in the tax layer. Most of the other forms are automatically going to roll over from the federal, so we don't really have a whole lot of adjustments for PA. Uh, there are some opportunities uh, that we can take a look at for what we consider tax forgiveness. The only trick with tax forgiveness, tax layer still must allow you to go in and check the box to say the taxpayer is eligible for the tax forgiveness program. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm going to kind of drop down to the bottom here before we get all overly excited about the tax forgiveness. and. Before we just start checking the box and say everyone's going to be eligible, if you have someone who's a dependent on someone else's return, they are not eligible for tax forgiveness unless their parents or whoever's claiming them on the return are eligible for tax forgiveness. So oftentimes we may have a student that comes in to get their taxes prepared uh, because of their income level that they normally would qualify under the chart for tax forgiveness. We do not want to check the box to say that they're eligible unless we know that their parents are eligible for tax forgiveness. So we just want to ask that question. But tax forgiveness is a tremendous benefit. So when we talked about that whole policy of you need $33 of income to file a return, a lot of our clients, particularly seniors, that they may have retirement income, social security income, and maybe a little bit of interest in dividends, quite often will pay zero to the Commonwealth because of our tax forgiveness program. And that's based on your marital status. If you're uh, single, if you're married, if you have dependents, uh, we do not need to memorize the chart. Tax layer will automatically go ahead and do the calculations on that for us. Tremendous benefit. We'll automatically calculate as long as we check the box to say the taxpayer is eligible. Now there are a couple things that when we talked about what PA is allowed to tax that have to come back into consideration. So for tax forgiveness, we do need to add back in any alimony that the taxpayer received, even though it's not taxable for PA purposes. That's now going to be an item of adjustment for tax forgiveness. Any of that non-taxable interest that we just covered would be coming back. And tax layer actually does a pretty good job of bringing those amounts over. So if it knows that you had it on the federal return, if it knows that you had those deductions, it should bring them over into uh, the calculation. The things that it doesn't always pick up are going to be the next three. Inheritance. So even though inheritances are not taxable for federal or state purposes for income tax, they are an adjustment for tax forgiveness. So if someone does inherit money, we have to uh, disclose the amount of inheritance that they received, and that may impact their ability for tax forgiveness for that year. Also, any non-taxable educational assistance. So that would be tax-free scholarships would be impacting their ability for tax forgiveness. And then also they'd have to add back the sale of a personal residence any gain that they'd have on those. So typically where we may see a situation, particularly if you have a senior citizen that's leaving their home and moving into a retirement uh, facility, they may have been accustomed to getting tax forgiveness for a number of years. If they sell their home and they have a gain from the sale of the principal residence, even though it may not be taxable for federal or state purposes, we still need to disclose that amount. And unfortunately, you don't need a whole lot of income to push you out of the, uh, self the uh, tax forgiveness program. So it may be a situation where they have to temporarily pay tax for a year. But that is one other item we need to add back in. So those last three, generally, we have to ask the client, and that is a manual adjustment within tax layer. Inheritance, uh, non-tax, and home sale. Yes, sir? Your parents out for tax forgiveness, they have no idea. Mm -hmm. They might call their parents and say, are you eligible? Parents say, I don't know, we've filed their return yet. Right. What, what do you do in that situation? Do you say, come back after your parents know, or do you? Right, yeah, so it's a good question about what happens, uh, bless you, what happens when an uh, uh, individual comes in and uh, we have some questions about how their parents are going to be filing the return. So generally what we always have to ask, uh, probably make sure their parents are going to claim them as a dependent. That's going to trigger a lot of different things within there. Um, the main, th main thing we take a look at, uh, probably if they can get in touch with their parents and say, did you qualify for tax forgiveness for the prior year? And has your income substantially changed from that prior year? Uh, the best case would be that we wait until the parents file 
file the return, but that may not happen until April 15th or even later, depending if their parents extend. But that'll give us the best indication of whether or not the parent did qualify for tax forgiveness in the past. So as long as they're within the tax forgiveness eligibility tables, the student would be eligible as well. Um, so we do want, probably want to inquire. Uh, it'd be great if the parents can get their return done. Maybe a great time to say, hey, mom and dad, how would you like to come in as long as you're VITA eligible to get your taxes prepared? Uh, if they say, I'm sorry, we're probably not VITA eligible, that may give you an indication they're probably not going to qualify for tax forgiveness. Um, most of those tables are going to be uh, kind of in line with where we'd be preparing returns. So if they say, well, let me double check with my accountant um, to determine whether or not I've taken tax forgiveness, the answer is probably not. Um, they, uh, if they have wage income, they're probably going to be outside of the tax forgiveness program. Yep. But it never hurts to ask. Uh, if you have that opportunity, probably double check. And if it sounds like they're probably not going to qualify, I'd probably say, do not do the tax forgiveness and file the return. If it sounds like it's close, um, you may want to just double check with the, uh, the taxpayer. All right. Great question. All right, just a couple other uh, little issues on the PA return, and then we're going to talk about some uh, tax credit opportunities uh, for PA. Uh, one of the other things we just want to mention, we had uh, indicated that traditionally retirement uh, payments are not taxable for PA. And that's true. Pennsylvania does not tax retirement uh, distributions as long as they're in connection with retirement. However, there are some payments that people might be taking off a of 1099R that are not actually retirement distributions. So if you have an individual who's invested in an annuity, a non-retirement investment account, they've taken money, they put it in generally with a life insurance or other brokerage company, and they're going to be getting a stream of payments either over life or a period of time, those are not retirement payments. They're still going to be reported on 1099-R. So the question is, how do we determine whether or not any of those are taxable for PA? The trick is to look at the 1099-R box 7 codes. If you see a D in box 7, it's going to indicate that it is a payment from a life insurance or annuity. So those would be taxable for PA purposes. So if you do see a 7D in box 7, it means that that amount of income, whatever is the taxable amount of income, is also going to be taxable for PA. And there is an adjustment uh, within the 1099R section of TaxSlayer that you can add state taxable amount. And it should put it in the correct box to have it flow through. Pennsylvania actually considers this investment income. This is actually the earnings off that annuity account. So even though it's coming off a of 1099R, Pennsylvania is going to treat it as investment income, not as retirement income. So just one thing to take a look at there as we go through that process. Yes, sir. Well, so, so most annuities are going to be either, they could be within your retirement account. And if they're within your retirement account, they're fine. They're going to be qualified for purposes of PA uh, taxes. If they're an outside investment, so if someone has some money and they decided I'd like to buy an annuity rather than put money into a stock or mutual fund, those are going to be what's taxable for PA. So what we're looking at is, is really your investment option. So if you said, I, I'll go to an investment broker, my insurance agent, and they put me in an annuity, that's, if it's not through a retirement account is a non-retirement annuity which would cause it to be taxable. Good. Yes, sir. Right. Right. So the question is, is basically uh, annuities are part of their own contribution and part of the earnings on the plan. What we generally go with is what the annuity company, they will actually go through the calculation and determine the taxable amount being uh, in, in consideration of how much the, uh, the uh, taxpayers put into the plan versus how much are earnings. So they'll actually calculate the 1099-R as long as it's still with the same uh, institution that you bought the annuity with. They will calculate the taxable amount. Uh, and there can be cases where uh, they're still receiving their, their amount, and uh, if it's uh, considered recovery of cost, that will be uh, reflected in the taxable income piece. So the feds will not tax your own money coming back to you either. So it's just a little bit different. Um, um, usually we're going to rely on the 1099-R to determine the taxable amount. So sometimes what we'll see in the earlier years, they consider it as earnings coming out first, technically PA is a cost recovery first. But our ability to go through and recalculate that, sometimes it's easier to use the 1099-R because they will eventually catch up to their entire basis. Okay, so again, that trigger is going to be a 7D in the 1099-R. 
Right, that's correct. So if it's just a uh, seven, it's not going to be taxed for PA. If it's any just number, we're okay. If it's a letter like a G, we're all right. The D is going to be the one that throws us off. And 7D. 7D, yeah. So the seven is going to be uh, in the indication is a normal distribution, uh, and D is going to be indicating it's coming out of a retirement account. Uh, there can be some other ones in there as well. Uh, if you have a, a charitable gift annuity, sometimes you'll see individuals that have done a, a program with a church or other type of a institution, a charity. Uh, those would be taxable as well because they're non-retirement annuities. So if you see something in box uh, seven, just take a look at it. Uh, and then uh, again, if you flip over the 1099R or if you take a look at your 4012, it'll indicate what those codes are. But 7D is kind of our big indication that it's a non-retirement annuity. Um, I, I will caution you, if you ask a client, sometimes they don't even know what kind of a distribution it's coming out of. They'll say, I never bought an annuity. Okay, that's fine. I know you didn't buy an annuity. I'm just going to treat it like it is an annuity, like it is shown on the 1099R. The other technique that we generally see is that these are coming most likely from an uh, insurance company. Uh, usually it's probably going to be coming from one of the larger insurance providers or annuity providers. If it's coming out of something like a Fidelity or Vanguard, it's probably a retirement account. If it's coming out of Northwestern Mutual, it may be either an IRA or a, an annuity, depending on those types of things. But usually the ones I see are coming out of life insurance companies. Okay, any other questions on annuities? All right, now one of the fun questions we have to ask with PA returns. So there are a couple things we do need to inquire. Pennsylvania has a use tax uh, requirement for residents of PA. What use tax is, is a complement to our sales tax program. So when you buy things in Pennsylvania, as long as they're subject to sales tax, you need to pay 6% on anything that you buy within PA or from an online provider that is uh, collecting sales tax. So fortunately, places like Amazon now collect sales tax. A couple years ago, you could buy anything you wanted and not pay sales tax. Now, to not pay sales tax, you have to find another provider or drive to Delaware uh, to avoid paying sales tax. But the Commonwealth knows there are options that you can avoid paying money to the uh, Commonwealth. What they have is a provision to say, we would like you to pay use tax. So if you didn't pay sales tax, you can go ahead and self-report any use tax that you would owe. The interesting part about use tax, it is a uh, tax on the books of the Commonwealth, but there is no mandatory reporting for use tax. It's a line that's a voluntary reporting process. Uh, we do not actually have an audit provision for use tax for individuals. Businesses do, but not individuals. So we ask the question on the return, would you like to report any use tax for the year to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? In most cases, you get a blank look to say, what in the world is use tax? And then you can either go through and explain, well, if you happen to be out of state and you bought something that did not have 6% sales tax or something less than 6% sales tax, you may voluntarily report those, those transactions on the return and submit the difference to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania with your, 10, with your PA40. So if you went on vacation up to New Hampshire and you got some souvenirs, you bought a snow globe or some molasses or some delicious um, syrup, you can report the use tax that you owe for bringing that back into PA. Most of them say, I've never calculated that amount. I have actually had clients in the past that come in with an entire list of things that they bought out of state, uh, and they will calculate to the penny how much they owe. Um, it's a rare occasion. I think uh, we have a couple other people have done it. They have had, uh, had it done twice. Uh, it, it's unique. Some of them know about it. Uh, but usually I take a look at it and say, would you like to make a voluntary contribution to the Treasury of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Because that's where the money's going. Um, if you choose to report uh, that you have use tax, uh, you may certainly do that. You can come up with all of your receipts. You can total it up and give them a number. Again, the state's not going to audit you. They're just going to go ahead and take your money and thank you for self-reporting. Uh, if you decide that you'd like to buy a large luxury yacht and register in the state of Delaware to avoid paying sales tax, you may self-report that to PA. Most of our clients are not going to be buying large luxury yachts and registering them in Delaware. Uh, if you do uh, have the uh, ability to say, I believe I have use tax, but I don't know how much that is, the system can calculate it for you. It's actually on a sliding scale. Usually if you have less than $15,000, you can add $6 to your return. 
You're between 15,000 and 30,000, they'll add $12. If you're above 30 up to 50, they'll add $17. Again, what this is going to do is two things. One, give more money to the Commonwealth and maybe help your clients sleep better at night. Um, but again, this is a completely optional area to fill out. We do need to ask the question, do you have any use tax that you would like to report? Uh, in some cases, maybe they're going to bring an entire list in uh, for your two clients that have done that. Uh, have many other uh, preparers run into that situation in the past where people would like to pay anything other than one? Okay. Do they go with the default or do they bring in their own list? Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, excellent. So that, that's a great opportunity. If you want to contribute to the uh, to help pay down the, the Commonwealth's debt, you can certainly do that. Um, and on the PA40, not I, I guess I don't think we've had a lot of clients do this. You can actually contribute to a lot of other charities on the back of the PA40 as well. Um, again, we probably haven't seen a whole lot of that. But if you do have a client who would like to tip the uh, Commonwealth for the uh, services you're getting, this is a great opportunity to say, put a number down, whatever you'd like to contribute. It's almost like you're going to the uh, pharmacy and they ask if you'd like to give a dollar to the uh, charity uh, of the week there. All right. So just an option, a question you have to ask when you go through the PA return. Do you have any use tax you'd like to report? In most cases, the answer is probably going to be, I have no idea what you're talking about. In that case, we can say zero is fine and we can move on. All right. So one of the areas that we do see that we have some benefit, uh, a lot of clients may be coming in. We have some senior citizens that may not have a federal tax obligation. Maybe their income is too low for filing. Perhaps all their income is just coming out of Social Security, which would make it non-taxable for federal. Perhaps if they have a little bit of income for PA, they're over the $33, but with tax forgiveness, they don't owe any money. One of the reasons they might be coming in is for this program that called Property Tax Rent Rebate. Uh, it's a form that we can help prepare for them. Uh, we can prepare it directly out of tax layer. It's not a manual form that we need to work with. But what the program does is it benefits seniors age 65 or older, widows or widowers age 50 or older, and anyone who has a permanent uh, disability uh, age 18 or older. So those are the categories of income or the categories of uh, eligible participants in the uh, rent rebate program. Now, we do have some limitations on income. The uh, income is going to kind of phase out a little bit here, uh, a little over $36,000 for homeowners. Uh, once you're above that, you do not get any benefit. Renters is a lot less. It's uh, generally just under $16,000 of income uh, before you're out of the uh, benefit. The system, again, will automatically calculate most of the income. It's going to bring in all of your taxable income from PA plus 50% of your Social Security benefits. However, there are a couple things we need to add back in again. Inheritance, alimony, spousal support, and any gain from the sale of a principal residence are items that have to be included back in the income. Um, so sometimes we'll see again in a transition period where someone might be moving from their home into a different facility uh, that they're not going to be eligible for PA property tax or rent rebate in that year because the sale of the home income will uh, potentially push them over the uh, limit. Particularly if they bought their home and they've lived in it for about 30 or 40 years, even though they probably don't have any federal taxable gain or PA taxable gain, it may take them out of the uh, opportunity for PA tax forgiveness. So just want to kind of show you a quick chart. Uh, again, you do not need to memorize these numbers. These are just mainly for purposes of understanding how the uh, tax credit will be calculated. Uh, to get a maximum credit for homeowners, again, we're going to phase out uh, to the next level around $8,000. Between eight and 15000 goes down to about five hundred. Fifteen dollars 18 we drop again until we get to our kind of top level phase out there. Renters are a lot less. They start uh, phasing out uh, from the top six fifty dollars once they hit 8000 and pretty much done right after around $15,000. The numbers change a little bit each year with cost of living increase. So the chart's a little bit different from what you actually see in calculation. But just to kind of give you an indication of where people wind up. When we prepare the return, uh, again, the PA 1000, which is the property tax rent rebate, will get most of its information directly from TaxSlayer with the exception of things that we need to enter, the inheritance, alimony, and any sale of a personal residence. 
if the taxpayer has lived in PA for the entire year, you do not need to attach any social security statements. Um, in fact, the policy typically with most sites is we're gonna attach page one of the 1040 and submit that with a PA 1000, along with one of these other two attachments for either a homeowner or renter. Uh, but again, what we're gonna try and take a look at is uh, the system will go ahead and calculate the income with a couple exceptions, and then we just need to determine whether they're a homeowner or a renter or perhaps both. Um, and if that's the case, we'll just attach some additional documentation. If they're a homeowner, they're going to be claiming the PA property tax rebate. It's all in the same form. All we do is just check the box and say that they're a homeowner. We need to prove that they actually paid their real estate taxes. So that can be accomplished in a couple different ways. One is they can get a copy of their receipted tax bill. And that's actually going down to the uh, tax collector's office and asking for a copy of their bill. It'll be stamped uh, and receipted that they can send in with their um, PA 1000. If they do not have a receipted tax bill, they can actually provide a copy of their tax uh, notice due, both their spring and their fall, and a copy of the canceled checks to show that it had been paid. Uh, sometimes it's easier to go to the tax collector's office to go ahead and get that receipted bill than to get two canceled checks from your bank. Um, but either way is acceptable. If they still have a mortgage and they're paying their taxes through escrow, we can just simply send a copy of the form 1098. As long as it shows the amount of real estate taxes paid, that'll be acceptable for the Commonwealth to prepare their property tax rent rebate. Just to let you know, this form uh, typically uh, is due by June 30. It has been extended every year that I've been in practice to December 31st. But generally, you'll have taxpayers calling up immediately and say, where is my PA property tax rent rebate? It'll take a little while for the Commonwealth to process. And sometimes the amount may actually be higher than the amount that we request. It has uh, a lot to do with um, their income level and how much they're paying in income in uh, real estate taxes. If the amount that they're paying in real estate tax is above a certain percentage of their income, the state will automatically give them an additional amount back. Again, we don't calculate that on the PA 1000, uh, but that will be uh, just an additional check. So if anyone runs into someone and they come back and they said, hey, last year you told me I'd be getting 500. I got a lot more than that back from the state. What do I do? Well, you keep the money, that's fine. If they send you the check, you may keep it. Uh, and that's perfectly acceptable. So when we prepare the PA 1000, it's just gonna show the amount that's calculated uh, on that area. If someone happens to be a renter, what we need to attach is a uh, rent certificate, which has to be signed by the landlord, basically testifying that the uh, tenant uh, has lived there and that the landlord has paid real estate taxes. Uh, one of the areas that uh, was mentioned in our Tuesday morning session was uh, sometimes people who live in retirement communities may be in a tax exempt facility, meaning that they're not paying real estate tax. So they do not get the benefit of the property tax rent rebate because the landlord's not paying real estate tax. So we do need to get a copy of the rent certificate form uh, that can be uh, attached with the PA 1000 if they bring it in. We can prepare all the information for them. Sometimes they may not have all their documents together, so the options we have is we can complete what we have, send it back with the instructions on what else they need to get. Every once in a while, they'll come back into the site with all the information and say, now I have it together. And hopefully the greeter at that point can say, thank you very much, we'll put it in the envelope for you. You can lick it and put the stamp on it and send it in yourself. Um, but if we have the information together, we can uh, prepare it for them and let them mail it in. If not, we can send them back and let them know what else they need to, uh, to get. So again, for a homeowner, they need copies of their real estate tax bill. For a renter, they need their rent uh, certificate form. A couple other things that we have for the uh, PA property tax rent rebate. If they are a first time filer, we just need to prove a couple different things. First is age, if they're age 65 or older. Uh, we need to have a copy of certain documents. The one thing that I always find ironic is that for a lot of these documents, they're actually issued either by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or a subdivision. So if you've ever pulled a birth certificate, you'll see in big print, do not photocopy. So what's the first thing the state asks for? A copy of your birth certificate, which is issued in the state of Pennsylvania and says do not photocopy. But what their instructions say, we'd like a photocopy of a document we told you not to photocopy. Um, so we'll see how tax and, and government works here in terms of their language skills. But you can copy a birth certificate and send it with them. Uh, a driver's license can work, a passport, uh, if you have a, a, a PACE or a PACENET card, a Medicare card can all work as well. 
uh, if you have hospital birth records. So um, depending on how long someone was born, they may not actually have a birth certificate, but they have like a uh, hospital birth record, uh, which is still acceptable for proof of age, not acceptable to try and get a passport. You have to get that updated. Uh, you cannot use the actual birth notice in the newspaper. So if you can't find your birth certificate, but you found the scrapbook that your mother had with your lock of hair and your birth notice in, that doesn't work. You have to go get your actual birth record. Hopefully you have something else, driver's license or pay snack card. Uh, if you're a widow or widower, age uh, 50 or older, uh, basically what will happen from age 50 to 64, you're under the widow or widower category. At age 65, you'll move up to the age-based. Uh, if you are a widow or widower, you still need to prove age, just to show again that you're age 50. And you also need a copy of a death certificate, which again says do not photocopy. But those are the areas that we need to prove. Uh, if you're going to qualify under the uh, permanently disabled, what we need to have is one of three statements. One is either uh, if you have a Social Security or SSI disability, you'll get a copy of the SSI disability letter. That would be something that you would uh, be submitting with the PA-1000, so the award letter, photocopy that and attach that with the uh, PA-1000 for first time only. Once they're in the system, you do not need to have any of these uh, attachments. If someone's qualifying under a VA uh, benefit, uh, what they need is they'd have to provide the VA letter uh, to state that they are permanently disabled. And for anyone else, if they're not either going through SSI or the VA system, they'll need a personal physician statement, uh, which is a PS1000, uh, uh, just signed by the physician stating what their disability uh, would be. So again, first time filers, we just have a little bit more information. For the returning ones, it's fairly easy to go through. The system will do most of the work with a couple questions we need to go through. Uh, we'll just print an additional copy of the page one of the 1040 and uh, have them submit either their property tax bill or their renter certificate. Okay, that's PA returns in a nutshell.